last time we looked at the first half of Romans 2 where Paul is addressing a certain kind of person. He's addressing a privileged person, a person who is moral, someone who is to all intents and purposes respectable in the world. And Paul had a very simple point that in God's eyes those people are guilty. Everyone needs the gospel of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ's atonement for our sins. Without the gospel, without Christ, there is no place to hide. We're all ripe for God's impartial, just, righteous judgment. And nobody can complain about it, whether they're moral or immoral, whether they're respectable or disreputable. There are no exceptions and there are no excuses. Now, as Paul outlined his argument, he didn't just have in mind moral Gentiles. He also had in mind his own countrymen, the Jews. And what was implicit in the first half of this chapter becomes explicit in the second half. Paul is going to focus in particularly on his own countrymen. Jews scattered all over the Roman Empire from Jerusalem to Antioch to Corinth to Rome and then all the way back again. There was a remnant of Jews who trusted in Jesus. And there's still a remnant of Jews who trust in Jesus today, praise God. But the sad situation today was the same in Paul's day. Overall, the Jews were hard-hearted and unbelieving. They did not accept the gospel. They did not accept Jesus Christ. And you know what? It didn't trouble them because they fervently believed in God. They cherished his law and they were very aware and very proud of their privilege. And if they had heard the first chapter and a half of this letter read out, they would have thought... This doesn't concern us. We're okay. We're a people apart. And their confidence was twofold. Number one, they possessed the law. And number two, they had circumcision. The bedrock of their confidence. But they are in for a rude awakening because Paul is going to take both of these points of supreme Jewish confidence and he's going to dismantle them completely. In fact, he does such a good job of it that he is then obliged in verse 1 of chapter 3 to ask and answer the question, what advantage then is there in being a Jew? And further on in chapters 9 to 11, he is compelled to revisit the whole question of the Jews and God's purposes for them. Now, that's for another time. For the moment, suffice to say, there is advantage. And yet, Jewish history, Jewish knowledge... Jewish privilege are simply not enough. It won't avert God's wrath. It won't guarantee God's saving protection. Now we might ask the question, what advantage is there to being baptised? What advantage is there to meeting around the Lord's table? What advantage is there to committing to a local church? To, to reading and knowing God's word? And the answer, great advantage these things are good. They are means of grace, but they will not save you. They can't save you. If they are merely external things done totally apart from the heart, and if you rely on them as things that will earn you God's favour, well, I'm afraid that Paul's got some bad news for you. You're lost. You're hopelessly lost. You are no better than any Jew. You are no better than any of the categories of obviously wicked people that Paul talks about in these early chapters. So this is really a warning against false confidence. But there is encouragement and there is hope here for us as well. Now, before we go on, just a reminder of something I mentioned last time. That Paul, as he writes, is using a literary device that was common in the Greco-Roman world. And it's called the diatribe. So Paul is imagining that he is arguing with an opponent and, and, and they're fighting back against him they're objecting to what he's saying and so Paul writes in this way he poses questions which he then proceeds to answer and it's a device to, to help Paul's message to be clearer and also to be more punchy more memorable so in case we were wondering the you in verse 17 which is a very pointed you Paul isn't talking to one individual Jew well, he's not even addressing one particular grouping of Jew that he knew. He's actually addressing any Jew. 
then or today, who puts confidence in the external. And in fact, he is really addressing any of us who might put confidence in the external. Anyone here who is attracted to rules and to religion, but not to Jesus Christ. And so this is what who, is, who Paul is addressing this to. Now, he starts off in verses 17 and 18 in this way. He says, now you, if you call yourself a Jew, if you rely on the law and brag about your relationship to God, if you know his will and approve of what is superior, because you are instructed by the law. Now here we've got a checklist of Jewish privilege and it, I think it can be summed up in this way. We are exempt from God's wrath because we possess the law. So Paul goes through these various claims to privilege. If you call yourself a Jew, in other words, someone of the tribe of Judah, an Israelite, one of the chosen people of God. If you rely on the law, so a Jew is someone who has received God's special revelation, his law, a token of his love to them. Notice uh, it doesn't say if you obey the law, simply if you rely on the law, which tells us that the Jews believed that the very fact that they had the law, well, that was their security, irrespective of what they did with it. If you brag about your relationship to God, as some of you may have a Bible version which says boast, which perhaps is a bit confusing. Because later on in Romans 5.11, Paul talks about boasting in God through the Lord Jesus Christ. But that's a little bit different. That's a rejoicing in, in who Christ is and what God has done for us. This is, I think the NIV has got it right, this is a bragging. This is like that person who loves to name check that famous celebrity that they happen to know. This is vain boasting. We know God, is what they're saying. And linked to that, if you know his will and approve of what is superior, because you are instructed by the law. So you see, whereas the pagan Gentiles lived in spiritual and moral darkness, and they were slaves of their passions, the Jews had this superior insight and knowledge. They could distinguish, discern truth from error because of their possession of God's law. God had revealed it himself to them and they were in receipt of it. They were taught it in the synagogues. So they knew the will of God in the law. And all of this meant that the Jews felt that they were entirely equipped and entitled and responsible to teach others. Which is, I think, the gist of verses 20 and 21. If you are convinced that you are a guide for the blind, a light for those who are in the dark, an instructor of the foolish teacher of infants because you have in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth now of course the people of israel were always intended to be a nation that looked outwards because right back at the beginning if you remember god said to abraham all peoples on earth will be blessed through you and isaiah 49 6 speaks of israel being a light to the gentiles so God always intended for Israel to, to be a missional people, his ambassadors, living for him, shining his light to all the nations around. And the Jews should have been well equipped to serve this role. Notice that Paul says that in the law is the embodiment of knowledge and truth, which is an interesting way of putting it. We're perhaps tempted to think of God's law as just a sort of outward code, like, you know, the highway code, the green cross, whatever it was that they used to teach. Um, just, you know, a list of rules to follow. But, but it's not so, is it? This is priceless treasure. This is the revelation of the creator. This is his character, his purposes, the very point of our lives revealed. So this really is the embodiment of knowledge and truth. This is what the Jews have got in their keeping. And yet what difference did it make? Just imagine a man who's uh, got the biggest personal library of books in the world. All the most rare books, the greatest classics of history, philosophy, literature from two and a half thousand years. He's got them all. So in theory, this man has got access to the very best knowledge. He's got huge potential for, for personal growth 
for depth of wisdom and knowledge. He only needs to get up, go downstairs to his library and read. The only problem is that he's never read any of that library. He's very proud of it. He shows it off to all his guests. He, he tell you how many books he's got, but he hasn't read any of them. He hasn't got the faintest idea what his library contains. And therefore the libraries have no benefit to him other than his outward reputation. And this is the situation with the Jews. These would-be teachers of others, they don't teach themselves. The instructors of the foolish have never instructed their own hearts. The guides for the blind are blind themselves. The people who are meant to be shining the light of the law of God are in the dark. So they may be very proud of the law, but they don't truly know it. They've not uh, appropriated it. They've not applied it to their hearts. They don't know it. And Paul says, well, look, they, here's the evidence. They preach against stealing, but they're happy to steal. They forbid adultery, a terrible thing, but they're happy to practice it themselves. And they detest idol worship, but they're very happy to steal idols from pagan temples in order to use the materials and the precious metals. Now, Paul is not saying, of course, that all Jews were thieves or adulterers or robbers of temples. And in fact, we know that robbing pagan temples was a very rare thing that Jews very rarely did. But these are representative sins. They represent Jewish hypocrisy and inconsistency. They represent a people exclusively concerned with the external and the outward not the internal not the reality now I, I guess that the natural human defense at this point is well come on you're being a bit harsh they were only human I mean no one's perfect we all get it wrong at times now that's true but what Paul is talking about is not sincere people seeking to obey God's law and getting it wrong at times he's not talking about sinners who are seeking a savior He's talking about blatant hypocrisy, a people who are happy to lord over others, to brag about their special status, and yet they happily ignore the God they claim to worship, and they happily ignore the law they claim to cherish. In fact, it would have been better if the Jews hadn't trumpeted these privileges, because verse 24, God's name is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. Now, this is an allusion to two Old Testament verses, Isaiah 52 5 and Ezekiel 36 22 and in both the situation is this that God's name is being mocked and blasphemed because of the Jews because God's people are being oppressed by foreign nations because of their sin and the outside world looks on and laughs and they think you know God must be a small pathetic God he can't even protect his own people and the moral failure of the Jews in Paul's day brought similar derision. People looked at the Jews who were busy proclaiming their special status, how special they were. But all the outside world saw was Jewish immorality, selfishness, pride. And people thought, well, what a pathetic religion. What a pointless God. He obviously doesn't make any difference in the lives of his people. You see, we've got to remember this, that unbelievers aren't stupid. Far from it. Unbelievers can sniff out hypocrisy very, very easily. So if a person in this village claims to be a Christian and makes a big point of being a respectable religious person in the community, and yet they drive aggressively and dangerously on the roads, and they are tight and mean-spirited with their money, and they are known as a gossip, and they are always found getting drunk in the pub on a Friday evening, well, it's a denial of their Christian profession. It means that their own reputation is on the line, but worse, it's blasphemy against God. And it would have been better if that person had never claimed to be a Christian in the first place, because their life tells a different story. Now, of course, the answer to this is not merely to brush up on the outward and think, well, I better better make a bit of an effort here because as Jesus said in Matthew 15 the things that come out of the mouth actually come from the heart so out of the heart come evil thoughts and murder and slander and adultery and sexual immorality and so on 
So what comes out comes from within. And what's within must come out. So if the outward is going to change, the heart needs to change first, doesn't it? A person needs to be born again by the power of God. His laws need to be written on the heart of a person. But this wasn't the case for the Jews. God's laws and God's requirements were readily invoked, but they were never internalised. And this was the very, very sad situation that Paul saw as he travelled the length and the breadth of the Roman Empire. He sees a self-confident people claiming special exemption from the righteous judgment of God on the basis that they possessed the law, even though they despised that law and ignored the decrees of it. And the sad truth, the shocking truth, is that these people, for all their privilege, are no better than the pagan savage of chapter 1. Now, there's a, a second aspect of Jewish self-confidence, and this is something that Paul knew that any Jewish reader or hearer of his words would bring up. Circumcision. Now, circumcision was the sign of God's covenant with Abraham, and it was restated and required by the law of Moses. It was the sign of belonging. It was Israel's mark of identity. Now, it was actually considered hugely embarrassing in Roman society, which would have only deepened the Jewish sense of being different, set apart. And so in answer to Paul's teaching, they'd have listened to the first half of this sermon and they would have probably said something like this. How can God treat us like the Gentiles? We're assured of God's protection because we have circumcision. We have the visible sign, the seal of God's covenant with us. And uh, the truth was that they had developed a rather superstitious view of this. They'd almost viewed it as a, a magical charm, rather like something you'd get in Hogwarts that would shield them from harm. To put it another way, it was a, a bit like a person who takes out a very extensive insurance cover and they think, well, I've got my life and critical illness policy, I've got my income protection, and uh, I, think, I think my family and I are covered for any eventuality. That's how the Jews viewed circumcision, as an insurance document that covered them from God's judgment. But it was a grave error, because of course circumcision was but a signpost pointing to something deeper. We always say this, don't we? Whenever a person is baptised in our church, I know I always say this, that it's the sign, but it's not the reality. It's pointing to the reality but it's not the reality itself. Now, just imagine a new police officer. We haven't got Mike Dominey here today, so he'll probably tell me I've got all this wrong, but um, they've joined the police force. They've undergone training and they're given their uniform. Now the uniform identifies them as belonging to the force, but wearing the uniform isn't the job. It's just the sign. So the truth is they've actually got a far more difficult job to perform than just putting on some clothes. They've got commitments, they've got responsibilities to discharge. And if that police officer is lazy and insubordinate and worse, if they actually break the law deliberately, then they betray that uniform. And, and even though they may carry on wearing the uniform and apparently getting away with it, the truth is they're not really a police officer. They're a police officer in name only. And for the Jews, you see, circumcision was the identifying sign of covenant membership. It pointed to covenant membership, and covenant membership required far more than just being circumcised. It demanded obedience to God's law, to love him with all your heart, soul, mind and strength, and your neighbour as yourself. Serious, profound, weighty demands, and the Jews were ignoring that. They were treating circumcision as if it was the be-all and the end-all, and they just ignored God's law and routinely broke it. And Paul says that by ignoring the law, and instead of internalising it, by ignoring the demands of the covenant life, it was as if they never were under that covenant. It was as if they had never been circumcised. They were covenant people in name only. They were no better than the uncircumcised, which is what 20, verse 25 says. And then Paul actually goes even further. Just have a look at verses 
26 to 27. If those who are not circumcised keep the law's requirements, will they not be regarded as though they were circumcised? The one who is not circumcised physically and yet obeys the law will condemn you, even though you have the written code and circumcision. You're really a lawbreaker. Now these are remarkable words, aren't they? If you think about it, Paul is actually saying that some Jews aren't really Jews and that some Gentiles are Jews, which is shocking. After all, the law of Moses stipulated that a Jew must be circumcised. And yet Paul says that there are some circumcised Jews who will be condemned while it's possible for an uncircumcised person to obey the law. And their very obedience will be the evidence that condemns the disobedient Jew. It is an absolutely shocking reversal. I just want to have a, you to have a listen to these verses from Isaiah 60 verse 14. The sons of your oppressors will come bowing before you. All who despise you will bow down at your feet and will call you the city of the Lord, Zion, of the Holy One of Israel. Now that is a prophecy around 700 years before Christ. And it flashes forward to a future day when Israel would triumph over the nations and the pagan Gentile nations around them would be forced to submit to God's people and acknowledge that they were God's chosen possession. And this was part of a widely held view among the Jews that one day they would sit in judgment over the pagan uncircumcised Gentiles. And here is Paul turning it right on its head, flipping it around and putting the Gentiles in the place of the righteous and the Jews in the place of the unrighteous. You see, the truth is that obedience is the sign, not circumcision. Paul is not saying that salvation is by works, but he is saying that the evidence of salvation, the sign that a person belongs to God, is their obedience. And disobedience is the clear sign of godlessness and rebellion. And it's the thing that sends a person to hell. Now, as I said earlier, what is seen in a person's life, the outward, always comes from the inner, from the heart, from the seat of human emotion, the core of a person. And so if a person's heart is a frozen wasteland, devoid of any love for God, there won't be any obedience because there can't be any obedience. It's impossible. And in fact, I think the whole bigger argument that Paul has been building up over these two chapters is the total depravity of the human race. So it, it doesn't matter what privilege you give a person. It doesn't ma matter what revelation they're shown. Regardless of any external sign, Jew or Gentile, a person always defaults to sin because the heart of man is rotten and full of evil. And what is needed is not a turning over of a leaf. It's, it's the humanly speaking impossible thing, a brand new heart, a new moral compass, a new mind. And this remarkably is what Paul is hinting at in the final two verses. A man is not a Jew if he is only one outwardly, nor is circumcision merely outward and physical. No, a man is a Jew if he's one inwardly. And circumcision is circumcision of the heart, by the spirit, not by the written code. Such a man's praise is not from men, but from God. Paul is speaking of the Holy Spirit of God doing the impossible, taking that sinful fleshly heart of ours with all that horrible lust and greed and, and selfishness all those wicked evil things that we're ashamed of but we know are there he, he, he takes it and he cuts away all that sinful muck and he purifies it so that it is a brand new heart a circumcised heart set apart to God a heart that is alive to God a heart that desires to obey God a heart that overflows into outward obedience 
Now, this wasn't a novel idea. In fact, it wasn't Paul's idea. Because Deuteronomy 36 says, The Lord your God will circumcise your hearts and the hearts of your descendants, so that you may love him with all your heart and with all your soul and live. So in other words, even in the Old Testament, the physical rite of circumcision was never considered enough. It was always meant to be a picture of something internal and God always required the internal reality. So the true Jew, even in the Old Covenant, was someone with a circumcised heart. Not just someone who underwent the physical rite or sacrificed a goat on an altar. So this is a, not a new idea, but where Paul is so radical and so shocking is that he looks for obedience entirely apart from any physical right. So Paul renders the physical act of circumcision null and void. And he says that anybody of any ethnicity or culture is a Jew if their heart has been circumcised by the Holy Spirit. The Jews looked at the outward first, and, and many people do today. But Paul says that although a person's life matters, it matters because it stems from the inner life. And that's what always matters first. You can worship outwardly with all the trimmings of sincerity. You can jump the hoops. But worship that God accepts is worship that comes from a circumcised heart. And, and you can have all the approval of men that you want. And they might think that you're really godly. But what matters and what only matters is the approval of God. And you can have the approval of God through the gospel. Through the obedience that comes by faith. Through the Holy Spirit who gives a person a brand new heart. A new mind to understand and to obey. And this means that even in these apparently very depressing chapters where Paul is laying bare human pride and human sin, there is hope for humanity. But it's not hope in the things that we naturally put our hope in. Not in the external, not in right, not in ceremony, not in being a man pleaser and winning the approval of others. The hope is in the supernatural work of Almighty God through his spirit <coughs> inside the innermost being of a person. Now all this demonstrates, doesn't it, just how serious our sin is. That no quick fix, no sprucing things up outwardly can remedy it. The most serious, deep, spiritual heart surgery by God himself is what is required. And this is what many Jews of Paul's day simply didn't understand. They were supremely self-confident, they went about with a false a self-assurance, and Paul is writing and he wants to prick the Jewish balloon. He wants to burst their bubble. Not to hurt them, but in love to show them that they are in the exact same position as any other people group. To show them that they need to do what everyone needs to do. According to verse 4 of Romans 2, repent. Turn away from self and seek the Lord Jesus Christ. And perhaps there's someone here and you need this challenge. Because you set great store by your baptism. It was a wonderful experience. And you set great store by celebrating the Lord's Supper. It feels somehow important to you. And you set great store by your membership of a church. Or the fact that you read the Bible every day. And these are advantages for sure. They are means of grace. And they are intended as signposts to point you to the Lord. So that you believe in Christ. And keep on believing and abiding in him. But if you trust those things for salvation, they are of no value. If you think that they automatically make you a Christian, you're deceiving yourself. And if you think that you can partake in these things, these outward things, and then go away from this hall and live in, in, in whichever way you want in a way that tells a very different story. If you think that's a good thing, you've got another thing coming. All you are achieving is blasphemy against the precious name of God. You can pull the wool over the eyes of men. That's easy. But you can't fool God. And so Paul says to you, 
Just as he says to his own people, repent, turn away from yourself and pleasing yourself, turn to Jesus, run to Jesus. And the great news is, of course, that we find in our Bibles is, is the Lord is not hiding. He wants to be found. It was Adam and Eve, wasn't it, in the Garden of Eden who first hid from God. And people have been hiding from God ever since. And we hide behind all sorts of things, don't we? Morality, respectability, our possessions. But it's hiding. And yet God still loves us. He loves us so much. He wants us to see him in creation. Through his moral law written on every heart. Through his word. And supremely through his son. God entered our fallen world in the person of Jesus so that we might see him and perceive him more clearly and so that we might turn to him and believe in him and live and that's all that's needed circumcision totally unnecessary for salvation and it never could have saved a person anyway what matters today in the light of what Christ did on the cross is faith in his atoning death at Calvary for our sins. In him, the one who was perfectly obedient to the law of God, who fulfilled that law, in him we are considered perfectly righteous. And in him we inherit all the promises of the Old Testament. Now it's not that we replace the Jews, because Jesus says in John 4, salvation is from the Jews. So there is no salvation outside of Israel. But here's the wonderful truth that God's grace has expanded. And through faith in Jesus, the Jew, the Israel, we can become Jews of the heart. And through faith, we join God's Israel. We join the saints from the Old Testament who always knew that they were sinners in need of forgiveness. People like David and Moses and Samuel and Daniel... They never relied on circumcision for their faith. They, by faith, looked to God. Yes, they were circumcised Jews, but they were circumcised of the heart too. And today, Jew and Gentile may join that community by faith. We may join it by faith. All God's saving blessings through Abraham passed down to us. We can be grafted onto the vine. <laughs> Now, of course, there will be some surprises. And when we get to heaven, we'll see it. Some people who are Jew in name only will be broken off. And some people who are Christian in name only will be turned away from the gates of heaven. What matters, and this I think is the abiding message from this passage, what matters is the obedience of faith. Faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray together that the Lord will help us to see the wood from the trees, to see past all the signs and all the externals, to see beyond what other people think, to understand the simplicity of the gospel, that confidence comes simply from trusting in the atoning blood of Jesus Christ crucified. And may the Lord help us to do that. Amen. Amen.